sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we offer.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you this morning. I am um, really excited to be able to be here and communicate with you this morning what the Lord has put on my heart uh, to talk about. Um, I would rather be with you in person. I miss you guys so much. I am. Uh, I want to give you hugs. I want to uh, touch you. I want to be in contact with you. And it's really hard to not be uh, with you. But God is still moving and he is still God and he's still speaking to us. And I've been in communication with a lot of people. The, the Tuesday and Friday small group has been going really good. And it's good to hear what some of the different people are hearing from God and, and uh, when they share that um, and to be in connection uh, Keith, Keith Kincaid shared something that was really interesting with me this week, and, and he shared it again at the small group, and that was that um, he was woken up 
at night, one night in the last couple of weeks, he was woken up with a lack of fear that his fear had been taken away. And it was so unusual that it woke him up and, and it kind of communicated to me that, that fear can be something that is, uh, it just sits at the back of your brain. It, it's a weight that is on you and, uh, and it weighs you down. And pretty soon you don't even realize what it is that is weighing you down. Uh, but it's that fear. It's that fear. And, and when it was taken away from him, God had delivered him from that fear. It woke him up. The peace woke him up. And, and may we all be woken up with peace. And, and what I want to talk about today has to do with, uh, with fear, but kind of in a different way. We've been talking about fear a lot over the last few weeks. Even Happy, uh, in the midweek address this week, uh, talked about fear. Uh, because it's something that, that I think a lot of us are, are dealing with right now, and it's a good thing to communicate about. Uh, but today I want to talk about what the freedom from fear looks like. Uh, I want to start in, uh, in the scripture where Jesus calms the storm this morning, and it's uh, going to be in Matthew 8, verse 23. I'm going to read to you out of the ESV version this morning. It says, And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? You know, it's, it's, um, it's the, the disciples were not ignorant of ships and boats and how they worked. And, and, and some of them even were experts. And so when they saw this storm and it was raging and it, it, it was swamping the boat, they were terrified. Matter of fact, they thought that they were in, in mortal danger. And it, it wasn't without reason that they thought that they were in mortal danger. They weren't novices to traveling this way. But they thought they were in moral danger because they had logical reason to think that they were in danger. But they forgot something. They forgot that Jesus was sleeping in the boat. See, if Jesus is sleeping in your boat, it's not going to sink. The only boat that was okay on the waters was probably the one that Jesus is sleeping in. If Jesus had rose up and took off running across the waves to get away from the boat, then you've got a problem. But if Jesus is sleeping in your boat, it's not going to sink. It's, it's interesting that he woke up and he said to them, why are you afraid? You of little faith. Do you think that they were more safe after Jesus calmed the storm than they were before Jesus calmed the storm? I don't think so. I think that they were perfectly safe because Jesus was sleeping in the boat. That boat is not sinking. It doesn't matter what is happening outside the boat if Jesus is sleeping in it. There could be tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, but if Jesus is in the boat, it's not going down. In our lives, we need to make sure that Jesus is in our boat. If Jesus is in our boat, if we're walking in his way and his plans and his purposes, even though he be quiet, even though it seemed that he's asleep in our lives, our boat's not going to sink. And I think that the first message this morning is to make sure that Jesus is in your boat. If you're a person this morning and you don't have Jesus in your boat, then you're living a life 
of uncertainty. You're living a life of danger. Your boat could sink, but if Jesus is in your boat, you're going to be okay. So the first point this morning is just to make sure Jesus is in your boat. And the way to do that is look for Jesus. In whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through in your life, stop for a moment and look around and see where Jesus is at in that moment, in in your life, in that circumstance. If Jesus is there, then you don't have to worry. You're safe. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter the turmoil or the storm or the things that are happening in your life. If you're with Jesus, you're going to be okay. It's interesting that Jesus said, why are you afraid? And, And I think that he would say that to us sometimes. And it's not, you know, I've heard it said recently in a, in a sermon that, um, that Jesus commands us to not be afraid and therefore fear is a sin. But I, I don't think that is the heart with which he's saying th- this, this thing he says when he says, uh, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? I think that he sends it with tenderness and with care and a father type of attitude towards us. There's another scripture that I really love, and it says, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, fear not, little flock. It is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I think that's God's heart for us. And I think that in the same way that if we go into our kid's room and they're afraid of a terror under the bed or in the closet, the way that we say to them, don't be afraid, it's going to be okay. It's the same way that Jesus is saying to us today, fear not. But he might ask us, why are you afraid? And what he's asking is, don't you know who I am in your life? Don't you know what I've done? And don't you know what I'm capable of? I am with you. And I think that the first thing Jesus would say to you this morning is, I'm with you. Do not be afraid. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anxiety because I am with you this morning. There's a second point that I'd like to make this morning, and and that's that being free of fear, being delivered of fear, gives us freedom to respond to others in the way that we ought to. In in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 22, it says, it says this: So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone and able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You can't exercise this instruction if you are busy defending yourself. And what happens if if you're full of fear and afraid of those that are attacking you or those that would come into opposition against you or those that would accuse you or those uh, that would disagree with you or want to argue about certain things in doctrine or want to argue about certain religions and theology, you can't treat them this way. You can't be kind to everyone. You you can't be able to teach and patiently enduring evil and, and gently correcting If you're fearful in defending who you are and what you believe and what you want to say and what your agenda is. See, that fear, that need to defend ourselves um, prevents us from treating people in this way. I think that the last two especially are difficult for us sometimes. Patiently enduring evil. There's something about us that when somebody does evil against us, We want to lash out against them. 
We want to uh, push that back and defend ourselves. And you aren't the boss of me. And you can't come in and accuse me of that. And you can't attack me. But it says patiently enduring evil. It says gently correcting. And I, I think if we look at the way that we debate and the way that we argue our viewpoint, I, I think if we examine ourselves... We can't always say that the way that we're interacting with people is a gentle correction. It's a forceful correction sometimes, but not always a gentle correction. I think that being free from needing to defend our own viewpoint, be resting in this boat that Jesus is in, gives us the room to act towards others in the way that we ought to. It's, it's interesting that, G, that God has never actually asked us or called us to defend the gospel. What we're called to do is not defend the gospel, but to be an example of the gospel, be an example of Jesus Christ in the world, not to, to form a defense for the gospel, but to love people and to treat people the way that, that Jesus did. God doesn't need us to defend the gospel. Did did you think of that? God doesn't need us to be a defender of the gospel. God can defend the gospel all by himself. But what he has called us to do, his desire for us, is to be an example of what the gospel is in people's lives. You know, I hear people talking uh, about a lot of stuff right now. I, I miss people, and I'm probably on Facebook more often than I ought to be. But it's kind of a thermometer to me of general public opinion and what people are going through. And, and the longer that people are closed in, the longer that they're in isolation, the more they're lashing out and having all these arguments and conspiracy theories and ideas about what's going on. I hear everything from that, that there's a, a vaccine agenda and all of this has been orchestrated to get us to force people to have vaccines all the way over to Bill Gates is trying to kill off a population of the world and insert microchips into everybody. And he's got this, this antichrist sort of end of times agenda and they're vilifying uh, Bill Gates. I hear people lashing out. Um, and I, I'm not here this morning to say that, that those things are wrong or they're right, or that there's merit or not merit to those things. That's, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what their agenda is. It doesn't matter what the government's agenda is. It doesn't matter what Bill Gates' agenda is. It doesn't matter. We are called to treat people in a certain way. There are scriptures that tell us how to respond to people who are trying to harm us. And I'm going to read those to you right now. And they're challenging scriptures. But this is God's call for us against anybody that would come against us. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 38 says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It goes on to say, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's hard for us. Do not resist the one that comes at you in evil. If somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek and let them slap that one too. How are we able to do this? How can someone survive in a world when they're just letting people persecute them? The, the answer is that God loves us, that God is in us, and Jesus is sleeping in our boat. 
nothing that is going on around us and the storm that is coming against us and the things that are swamping our boat can sink us because Jesus is with us. It doesn't matter what the storm looks like. It doesn't matter what Bill Gates is doing. It doesn't matter what the government is doing. It doesn't matter all these things that are going on. And I'm going to tell you that if you are busy fighting the fight against the things that are going on in the world, then you're missing what's important. And what's important is putting your eyes on Jesus. God has called us to be a witness to those who are in the world and an example of Christ and the way that we love and the way that we treat people and the way that we embrace people who need Jesus. I think that, that uh, there are people right now that need Jesus in their boat. There are people that are going through this without that assurance. And we as the church are not called to be the ones that are throwing these wild conspiracy theories all over the place, but we're, we're called to be a light of what it means to be full of joy and peace and assurance and, and God and the Holy Spirit in the time of trouble. I, I, would, I would challenge the people that, that are part of my church, the people that are part of our fellowship, and, and, the, and, and Christians everywhere, um, examine your heart right now. What is your heart saying? It, would Jesus wake from the storm and say, well done? Or would he ask you, why are you afraid? Why are you lashing out against the world? Why are you fighting fights that I'm not fighting? I'm not even worried about that stuff. Are you keeping your eyes on me? And so let's do that. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to grow. I thank you for this opportunity to, to uh, turn our attention back to what really matters, which is your presence in our lives, Lord, who you are, what you want, your agenda, your purposes, Lord. Let us seek your face and ask you, what do you want in this time, Lord? Shine through our lives in such a way uh, that we can be a light in people's lives, Lord. I pray right now, uh, just as Keith was saying, that we would awake at night from the absence of fear in our life and that that lack of fear would give us the room and the opportunity to love people, to love uh, even Bill Gates and even the government and even the officials and even Governor Brown in such a way uh, that we are shining the light of Jesus on their lives. Let us be known for the way that we love. And uh, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone.